Well, welcome back to Potter's Pockets, episode 12. And it looks like we have gotten through one of our biggest technical issues from last time immediately. Welcome back, Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. Wesley Chance. Oh, hey. How's oh, hey. Look at us overcoming obstacles and hurdles together, just like our favorite trio. <laughs> <That's us. laughs> I'm pretty proud of us for getting on this the first time. It took us a substantial amount of amount of time last time and I felt like my attitude never recovered um <laughs> when in doubt go to the library right yeah yeah good point <laughs> Frankly, you know this weekend I don't know if I could handle it I got walloped in frisbee yesterday and then my friend who took me mountain biking and mountain biking goes on a blue green black trail just like skiing I've heard and he takes me on blacks even though it's like my third time ever mountain biking he was also serving me a heavy dose of criticism about my frisbee game so my oh, answer just has not been strong with athletics this uh this weekend wood is riding me hard as it were oh, and yeah. uh, so than uh, malfoy yeah that's a good point that's a good point so well wes i i know that uh you and sarah were saying that you understood some connection that i don't think i made um uh earlier in text and you you said you wanted to say words about the writing on the wall and i know i could stand to learn something about the writing on the wall so uh well would you yeah. like to that? yeah thanks for reminding me I forgot about it it slipped my mind and then i forgot about it again in the meantime between then and now so <laughs> anyway chapter chapter nine the writing on the wall um obviously the actual writing in this book harry potter um is is referring to the Heir of Slytherin being back and the Chamber of Secrets being open. Um, but the the phrase itself, like the writing on the wall, is a phrase that you hear in everyday speech. It's like an idiom that's passed into the language, uh, which refers to like, you use it sort of like whenever something looks pretty um, like doomed or like faded to happen. Mm -hmm. Writing's on the wall, you say. Yeah. So it's like, it's it's been fore, foretold. It's, it's obvious. And, it's yeah well i don't know so much that like that's one sense that you can use it with but it's more like okay well so the the original like or uh, where it comes from the the illusion that's embedded in that idiom okay. which i guess might not be so well known now uh is is a biblical one like so many and mm -hmm. it goes back to yes. uh the old testament uh the book of daniel and it's the it's the scene where uh, Daniel is summoned to um, interpret the writing on the wall that appears um, spookily during uh, the Feast of the King. And the king can't interpret it, obviously, and none of his wise men can interpret it like like happens, you know, these kings. So they got to send for Daniel, who comes in and says, well, you know, this means that you're, if you don't change your ways, your your kingdom is doomed. You're going to, you're going to be. Uh, so it's something that's clear but obvious to none but he who can interpret the significance of the symbols. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, a chain star, uh, or Mars or whatever, sorry, in, in uh, the end of um, the first book. Like the Mars is bright tonight piece. Mm -hmm. the, it, I, I would say it's less about something being obvious and more about something being like a turning point clue right like as soon as like like um they use it in sports a lot too right like the writings on the wall yeah. that like look at the guy's statistics he's definitely not going to get a contract for next year right <laughs> it's usually bad yeah <laughs> yeah it, the, the the connotation is usually that we're headed into some type of um negative situation in the future sometimes the writing on the wall is only obvious in retrospect, right? Like we're looking at all mm. of these moments and there were even a ton in like chapters 12 through 14 for today where like things are sort of, if you know the ending of the story and then you go back and reread this a second or a third or a 10th time, you're like, you notice yeah. all of these writings on the wall that really aren't, um, obvious the first time but are the second time right like maybe like when when ron totally. says like you know why did he get a uh or a, an award for service to the school maybe he murdered murdered myrtle right which is har right? har har like yeah, that right. would have done everybody a favor um but but like he doesn't know he's making that as a as a hat like a, a hat tip joke um 
I also think that the allusion to Daniel is interesting because Daniel's famous for fighting the lions in a den, right? Um, right. Like facing beasts, maybe alone without without massive weapons. I, mm-hmm. I guess I could. I, I I'm not. It's been a while since I read the book of Daniel, but. Uh. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah, I, I did recognize it though. Like I, I saw it. It come. It comes up in Earthbound too, which is why I yeah. noticed it. Um, actually, it's it's like a thing, well, you know, um, mysterious words appearing with no obvious. Um, yeah, source. it seems interesting too because, uh, especially with your very interesting illusion, Sarah, about observing the writing on the wall the second time through the text, it's as if it's something that's there, but your attention isn't drawn to until after you understand its presence is there and so you're not hip to it until you see the pattern manifest sort mm-hmm. of like what we were talking about last time but that's in harry potter because we know that he's the person who can see the things or interpret the languages that others can't he's a seeker after the snitch that thing which uh malfoy can't even see next to his head and now we find that he's a parcel mouth who speaks parcel tongue and so he can hear this language and understand this language of this snake, this underground uh, uh, potentially killing force that has been released back into uh, the school. And, um, and it seems like just additionally, there is the writing on the wall that eventually a muggle is going to die if something's not done about this. Um, like, like it's a foregone conclusion in some way. Um, yeah. 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 It's very interesting. Um, I do like the idea that there's writing on the wall all over this, all over this book the entire time, because I guess it is like literally the writing on the wall. If you have the book on a bookshelf. (laughs) 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 All right. Well, so, okay. Well, so this time, so like usual, we got a little ahead of ourselves last time. We're very precocious like Hermione. And so for this time we were going to talk about 12, 13 and 14, the polyjuice potion, the very secret diary, and Cornelius Fudge. And I was, uh, where, where did y'all really want to start with that? I know we talked about Polyjuice Potion a little bit last time and just how convoluted some of these plans are. And we talked about whether that's sophomoric and whether that's sort of like the problem of being a sophomore. You have a little bit of wisdom, but not enough. And you don't stick to simple and useful plans. And then we talked a little bit about whether we were connecting with this story as much as the first one. And I started thinking, even though I always thought I liked the first and the second books best, that maybe I wasn't even connecting to the second one in the same way as the first one because of what Wes was mentioning about just how complicated everything is made in it. I, what did y'all think about that? Wait, so you weren't connecting because you and you and Wes previously had mentioned like maybe this was via text or maybe it was sort of alluded to in our previous conversation that like some of the plot twists felt uh, not convoluted, but more like perhaps contrived. Sure. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. um, Well, I mean, I think they need to find a way to lose Hermione here for some reason. And Mm. they, they do it initially through the polyjuice potion and by they, I mean J.K. Rowling um, does yes. it initially through the polyjuice potion and then through uh, like her discovery. But it's interesting. I think it's interesting that her discovery paralyzes her. Right. Yes. Like, I think it's re- I think that's really interesting. Um, and I, I wonder if there's some metaphor for like the learning experience in there. But I don't I don't know. But. Yeah, I want to examine that. I think you're right about something like that. And something I just want to add to that is just how long people get taken out of the game in the second book, which is something I totally didn't realize. After the polyjuice potion, Hermione is in the hospital wing for several weeks. I think it's over three weeks. I mean, that's a substantial amount of time to be without your friend down in the dormitory. And it, um, and, and, and also that con kid, he's out for like half the semester. And Miss Norris has gone for quite a bit of time. Um, and, and just to focus on Hermione, she not only gets knocked out for a few weeks, but then she gets knocked out near the end of term as well through, again, pursuing wisdom. And yeah, Wes, what do, you, what, do you see something emerging there? And if not, we're just going to talk to you about Dobby the whole time. No, no. <laughs> I, was looking, I think I got what I was looking for. Oh, this is funny. It's on page 258. But Harry was... Okay. A- Harry was only half listening. 
uh, it's the bottom of the page. You didn't seem to be able to get rid of the picture of Hermione lying on the hospital bed as though carved out of stone. If the culprit wasn't caught soon, he was looking at a lifetime back with the Dursleys. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Riddle had turned Hagrid in because he was faced with the prospect of a muggle orphanage if the school closed. Harry now knew exactly how he had felt. And so that's like a tip off, much like the ones that we would get from time to time in first book put yourself in Harry's shoes, see how he's right. feeling in this moment, you know, like this is important. Like it's, it's kind of, I don't know, as a reader, I don't know if the first time through you would necessarily catch it, but certainly, yeah. Something like as though carved out of stone. I think that's the first time that particular um, simile is used of these um, petrified uh, people. But it's, it's interesting there that we kind of get this, all kind of coming to a head for Harry bringing together the stuff about Tom Riddle and how, how much Harry is like him, you know, in that yes. respect of not wanting to go home and, and knowing he needs to, to find out what's going on, like for this very immediate, um, somewhat selfish reason, honestly. Right. But also it stems from worrying about Hermione and like being totally freaked out by, by what's happened to her. Um, so he, he can put himself, in Riddle's shoes, but also in Percy's, right? This is like where we see like Percy is kind of freaking out um, mm -hmm. about the prefect being being hurt. Or, or... Realizes his rank is no protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, later we learn that he has other reasons for being freaked out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of explains some of his crazy decisions or behavior over the last year. Yeah. I would I would say maybe also including why he stayed at Christmas. Uh, uh, but I mean, because earlier in the book, we did talk about how there were just these like little hints, uh, yes. like, you know, adolescent, uh, like nascent romance. Um, <laughs> but no, 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 I, I, I do think um, I, and even in the he understood exactly why Tom Riddle turned in Hagrid. I think it's interesting. One, it means that um, he understands why. So he, he, he can't quite bring himself to believe that Hagrid opened the chamber of secrets. Right. right. Like they even right. think like there's a, there's just a folly in asking him the question. It just seems right. ridiculous, but, but this whole time um, he's been accused falsely. So, if he can right. under if he can understand in this moment why Tom Riddle accused um, why Tom Riddle accused Hagrid um, you know falsely, then maybe he's also learning to have some understanding for Ernie McMillan's um, fear of him and like um, he seems to be you know uh, like growing a little bit in compassion maybe because he's been kind of you know, ostracized by his community, maybe also yeah. because he's starting to lose people who he's close to. But um, I also think it's interesting um, that that is writing on the wall for the rest of the, of the series where we learn that like um, there are a lot of other things that they have in common. Right. And then also um, like his ability to have compassion is the thing that like really ultimately distinguishes him right um yeah well said yeah and in so many ways i feel like this book is a book about exiles hagrid himself in exile from the wizarding community and cast dispersions upon by them argus filch for being a squib harry potter on the one hand having been in exile with the dursleys within their own home his entire life and now finding himself sort of an infamous exile uh, again in here and it seems as if part of what being in exile does enable you to do is to see the ways in which your fellow man gets ostracized for mm -hmm. one reason or another and I, I think you're completely right that that's a major difference between uh, Harry and and Tom Riddle even though they even have the same motivations for doing similar things like trying to bring an end to the killings in order to stay at the school, how they even go about it is different. Whereas Harry risks his own life in order to do that. Tom Riddle uh, uses another person as a scapegoat. Uh, he puts the blame on someone else in a very Slytherin style way. Um, and so I, I sort of wanted to ask you guys, 
about that creepy Tom Riddle idea that I came up with the other day, just a little bit. Yeah. Because I, well, I just yes. wanted to frame it in a non conspiracy theory sort of way. Because what seems weird about Ginny loving the book with Tom Riddle in it is perhaps she is so enamored with Tom Riddle because he is so similar to Harry, who she is enamored with. Yeah. Um, and so it is what Tom Riddle embodies that's similar to Harry that makes her like him. And I just wanted to connect that to the fact that. Myrtle was the one who was killed last time the chamber was open. And she seems to be very ashamed or always thinking that people are judging her for something as if she did something at some point that made people, that made people laugh at her, everybody, like everybody found something out about her that was deeply embarrassing. And it just made me wonder whether there had been something. Why is it that Myrtle was chosen? Why is it that Myrtle died? Was she chosen in the same way that Ginny was supposed to be chosen? Or did she stumble on something? Or is there something between her and Tom Riddle that could not happen if he was going to become a great dark wizard? That maybe he had to, I don't know, if he had feelings for her or something, sacrifice his feelings for her for greatness in some sort of Darth Sidious way? I don't know. But why do you think she was the one that, that was taken? Do y'all have some insight into that? Well, I think like later in the story, we learn her side of things. Like she tells mm -hmm. a version of how she died. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's actually later in this book. I could oh, be what? wrong. Um, do you remember, Wes? I think it might be in this book. And it has something to do with she was being made fun of. Mm hmm. I could be remembering from the movies, but um, she was being made fun of for her glasses. So yes. again, to your point about being ostracized, and right. she, she, so it maybe it wasn't like, like. And then she just ran into the bathroom, and the basilisk happened to be well, there. I think she heard, she heard Tom Riddle. I mean, mm. again, hashtag spoiler alert, but. Sure. Um, but like I think she she says that she overheard somebody hissing right speaking in what we would as as readers at that point know as again I'm I'm having trouble yeah, no, pinpointing I think, like no, is I, think this... I think I have to be symbolic if I want to hold that interpretation because that sounds right but yeah. maybe it's not appropriate I have to say that because of her glasses means people were making fun of her perspective and maybe she was attracted to something in Tom that should have repelled her like there was something dark and seductive about his strange and unusual powers that I mean, pushed yeah. him pushed her away but drew her in and he was dangerous that that um, that could be but i don't know I, just, I we don't see much of that like that would be here's what here's what i get from uh, sorry but i just found the page that it's on it's on 299 okay. in my book okay. at least Chamber of Secrets. Um, so it's a bit ahead. I haven't read this yet, but uh, it says, uh, uh, oh, it's you when she saw Harry. What do you want this time to ask you how you died? Myrtle's whole aspect changed at once. She looked as though she had never been asked such a flattering <laughs> question. So there's some, some some evidence for like, you know, this kind of boy girl dynamic. OK, ooh, it was dreadful. She said with relish. It happened right in here. I died in this very stall. I remember it so well I'd hidden because Olive Hornby was teasing me about my glasses. The door was locked. Oh, that was Wes got kicked off, but he'll be. Back. Did he really? Right as he was saying that. <laughs> Olive Hornby was teasing me about my glasses. The door was locked and I was crying. And then I heard somebody come in. They said something funny, a different language. I think it must have been. Uh, anyway, what really got me was that it was a boy speaking. So I unlocked the door to tell him to go and use his own toilet. And then Myrtle swelled importantly, her face shining. I died. How, said Harry. No idea, said Myrtle in hushed tones. I just remember seeing a pair of great big yellow eyes. My whole body sort of seized up and then I was floating away. And then I came back again. I was determined to haunt Olive Hornby, you see. Oh, she was sorry she ever laughed at my glasses, right? Like, so there's something like, I mean, uh, like, she takes a twisted amount of pride in, like, the way that she died and being able to tell her own version of that story, you know? Yes. Yes. And I think I see what Wes, Wes saw, but I, I want... 
Wes, are you back? Oh, yeah. Let me ask you. So what I think, well, what I saw, and maybe this is what you saw as well, is that when, when, uh, so Sarah finished the quote, by the way. Oh, good. She read, she read the quote, and that was very well read by both of you. That was a good job. Um, what kills Myrtle is she hears a boy speaking, she yells out, and then the inner nature of that boy is revealed to her, which kills her. Mm. Um, no. And I'm not sure. I don't know if that's what I see right now, at, maybe. But what, Wes, what is it about that passage that you saw? Oh, just that to, to support your read, I guess, that, that, that what she emphasizes, it, it was a boy. You know, that's uh, italicized there in, a, in the girl's bathroom, right? So this forbidden thing is happening and it has to do with sex. And mm -hmm. I don't see that she's necessarily attracted to the boy per se, but she does mm -hmm. have a fascination with her own death at the hands of this right situation. So there's, there's definitely something there. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not clear on it either. It's just something that kind of popped into my head and then I just started investigating it. And so I thought I would just throw it in front of the fires of y'all's intellect and see yeah. if you can burn it, burn it away. <laughs> um, but it's, I'm starting to see these books now that I'm reading them with y'all in, in a more symbolic and, and I don't mean like a, a trifling scholarly allegorical way as if the main story isn't a story unto itself, but that it's almost as if some of these magical stories are representations of things that do happen in our real lives. Um, and even well, like I think the that's, story of the mandrakes, right? Like, yeah. That's, they're partying now. That's all like, I mean, that's an important function of, of fantasy is that if it has to, it relies very deeply on like very real things. I think, I think you're right to see some of these th things as symbolic. I, I tend to read it more as argument mm. um, that like, using story and storylines and characters to make arguments about things or to make or to or perhaps to say something about the primary world ah that's interesting that makes a lot of sense that actually it, this is actually very good i think and so wes how do you often read the text um just so we can make our our parent perspectives apparent <laughs> apa well, i think yeah i think what i tend to do i guess i try to look at it with an eye to what the writer's doing a lot of the time and and thinking about it from the perspective again like i know the story okay having read it a few times um but not well enough to actually do this right right so right to learn well, how to tell we are story. quite literally triaging it <laughs> yeah well well so good. so yeah yeah, go on. I did. I did want to. I, I did want to kind of go back to the Tom Riddle, Harry Potter, like this this confrontation that happens and the way that it happens through the book. I, yes. I found it pretty interesting. Very provocative. Yes. Um, I was sucked in just as much as Harry Potter was to that situation. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on there exactly? Because it's sort of like chance, partly, right? He gets bumped. And and all his stuff gets um, messed up with ink, except the diary is clean. So then he realizes there's something weird about ink in the diary. Um, and then and then he how, how does this actually I want to like kind of go through step by step, I guess, to yeah. see like yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what that? is what is going on with the diary? Um, Do you know what pages that's around? Just so we can maybe it's we can... near like page. It starts um, like page two thirty six onward or so i do think it's important that this happens like around valentine's day and okay that's great yeah, that's so good and he gets like an awkward valentine oh, right oh that's so good from jenny and 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 malfoy of course makes fun of that well, and, and he hits the nail so on the head is it from if it's from jenny um i don't know that it's quite in jenny's character as of right now to do that Right. Mm. So you think that. that's like an adult thing? You think Tom Riddle suggested that to her? I do. Oh, oh, wow. Now that adds a whole nother sort of Patroclus Achilleus element into this too. He knows precisely what to say to Harry as if he were the same person. That's I what, mean, what makes you think that? Yeah. What makes you think that? That's so interesting. I just, 
Well, so, okay, that's all assuming that the Valentine is from Ginny, right? Like, yes, well, that's right. But she does get embarrassed and run away when she does, when Malfoy she says does, something about she that. She does blush, but she's blushed a lot this whole book. That's true. Right? So what if it is, what if it's, what if it's um, Malfoy trying to embarrass Harry, right? Um, that's, a, that's a fair point. But from, like, the narrative economy point, and I don't usually make these sorts of points, but... I have noticed that Ginny's name just gets thrown onto the page from by the narrator every now and then, right? Like, mm -hmm. and Ginny looked at her brother like this. So, like, she's also part of the writing on the wall this time through, right? It's like, why is Ginny all of a sudden entering the theater of our consciousnesses more? And so, I guess even if it wasn't her, she would be the person that everybody would assume, including Harry, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I suppose. Okay, so this is it's like page 236, 237. And um, uh, I think it's like Lockhart says something about how I've got like 46. Yes, with his gross little dwarf cupids. <laughs> love the dwarf uh, cupids. And, and, then, and then Ron says, Hermione, please tell me you weren't one of the 46. And she <laughs> became very interested in searching her bag for her schedule and doesn't uh. answer. Of course. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I think we all had like just I mean, like that's how you like learn about crushes, I guess. And that oh yeah. I never ever would have sent them a singing Valentine, but um <laughs> but uh someone re like calls out to Harry and you're right. So on page two thirty seven, um he he receives his Valentine in front of a line of first years, which happened to include Ginny Weasley. So you're right. There it the is. narrator goes out of out of the way to mention that she is standing right there. Mm -hmm. He's mortified. Um, <laughs> dot, dot. Terrible reaction for her too. So she's equally mortified too, right? Because if it's hers, go if on, sorry. Yeah, and then that's and he starts to like run away from this dwarf <laughs> that I think is dressed as Cupid or something. It tackles him by the legs. It starts to sing. <laughs> yeah, and then with a loud ripping noise, his bag split in two, his books won, parchment and quill spilled all onto the floor, and his ink bottle smashed over everything, which is, you know, there's some metaphor there about like just being totally exposed, right? Sure. Um, and then he scrambles and picks everything up um and yeah then he gets and he's sitting on harry's ankles and then gives his singing valentine <laughs> he says yeah, no, go on harry would have given all the golden green gods to evaporate <laughs> on the spot trying valiantly to laugh along with everyone else he got up his feet numb from the weight of the dwarf as percy did his best to disperse the crowd some of whom were crying with mirth <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's incredible but yeah it's funny you reading at that time and drawing attention to the fact that the ink doesn't affect the book and the transmission of an evil object from one vessel to another makes me think of a connection that we were making a lot in the first book between like say the ring of power from the Lord of the Rings series and how it uses vessels like humans and column in order to administer its will and so I know it's getting a little bit away from the Tom Riddle and Harry Potter connection, but seeing, seeing a, a person as a vessel for the will of darkness mm. does seem to be a, connected to the theme y'all were first, you were first bringing up or, or really making last time about uh, evil objects and their yeah. presence in, in this world. And this one seems to be like sort of a super evil, like the ring of power, because it seems to have a sentience. It, it seems does. to be capable of malice. I got to I got to say just one more quick thing about that scene. I think yeah. it's, so it's really interesting to me that like um his, his everything first of all the ink that spills all over the the diary is scarlet which ah, of course is the color of blood. And then um I do think it's really interesting also Ron is having trouble with his wand again. <laughs> 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 Obviously a metaphor in that. Um, speaking, yeah, whatever. I don't need to further <laughs> explain that. Um, He's but, having trouble with his masculinity. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but I think it's interesting that Malfoy is the one who picks it up. And um, uh -huh. and that, like, in being really defensive of this object, Harry, in a way, saves Malfoy from it. Right? Like, 
Not that yeah. I mean that assumes that Malfoy would have become as interested in it as um as Harry is. Like it assumes that Malfoy wouldn't just like throw it in his chest. He doesn't really seem to be in into books anyway. But like, um, but like, I think that that's interesting. That oddly, Harry's Harry is um he saves his so-called enemy right like no and he seems to confront evil far earlier in his life than Malfoy really does like it that almost seems to light up that that scene where Malfoy can't see the snitch in front of his own face but Harry can that um even though Malfoy wants to be so bad all he ever does is mirror and mock Harry Potter when he could just live his own life and he could be a hero or or even a villain if he were really up to it. So we'll see, you know, much later on in the series that when he has to uh, confront evil, he makes the wrong choice and it really just eats him up inside. That he really shows his his lesser character than uh, Harry explicitly. Then, yeah, um, yeah, Wes, yeah. Or I was thinking about. Uh, so yeah, I love the way that the diary is introduced as well. It's like it comes out of the toilet. Right, um, <laughs> Myrtle's toilet, and then like another and, philosopher's stone. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. And, and so, you know, what more valuable thing could it be? Yeah, and so then, Harry discovers that there's something weird to do with ink, and and the way that this diary works is that it absorbs ink, right? So once he puts that together, then this is what I find pretty interesting too: is that the first thing that he does once he discovers for sure this is how this thing works is he writes a full sentence on it um after a single blot uh on the first page then he writes my name is harry potter so that's that's the thing he goes to right to sort of like test his theory um Mm. using actual words that's like the phrase that comes to mind and i was trying to think i don't know like when people try a microphone out they say testing testing one two three they count they sort of like draw attention to the fact that it is a test so i'm interested that he doesn't ask a question right away he he writes a statement um Hmm. and ends to do with who he is right it's sort of like declares himself um but what the what the diary does is then come back with the question right how did you come by my diary after after it introduces itself um so and it so is seeking information from him rather than giving him information. But I guess that's what, yeah. yeah. It's funny, right? So it's like the the words here, riddle, <laughs> um, is, is like prominent. I think it should leap off the page. And, and what it does is sort of like, yeah, wheedle information out of him um, and kind of like draw him in pretty much yes. literally towards the yes. end there. As literally uh, as possible. Into mm-hmm. its pages. And to, yeah. just to add something to that connection, you said, I think, Sarah, you said it was Scarlet Like Blood. And something interesting is that the, the book will, again, spoiler alert, try and absorb the life force of Ginny in order to restore Tom Riddle to life. And so it's as if one is sacrificed for the story of someone who has already existed. Mm. It's, it's as if one pours one bl- one's blood into somebody else's story. And like the book is like the vampire that Quirrell is in the first book that has yeah. to live on the soul of another. It's like, it, it is, it is very much like a vampire in, in that respect. And that it, it, it takes the agency of one person in order to maintain its own uh, agency and, and life force. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm missing the last step with that thought though and what that means exactly um so so i guess i'll just leave it with y'all that that those are just additional connections i'm seeing this moment um because there's something there's just something there there's a riddle in my head right now that i haven't figured out (laughs) well i think um something okay a couple things one um if i that's a really interesting idea that the the book consumes um, yes. or like sub- rather than you consuming the book right yeah. subsumes um uh the blood or th- the ideas or the words of whoever it's writing to and starts to use yes use the user so to speak um for its own life right because their own ink and their life yes. yeah and because it's like what that means though is that 
somehow Ginny and then now Harry, like the as as humans or wizards and or both, um, there's something about their ideas that is like blood, or there's some there's a relationship between blood and ink, right? Um, and and you know maybe that maybe that there's metaphor and symbolism and all that. That's one. Two. Um, it also makes. The if Quirrell and the book are both kind of like the host, um, mm-hmm. then uh, it makes Ginny and a unicorn right in a similar yes. position, right? Oh, that's excellent. So that's very good. So that I mean, of course, the unicorn was purely without agency and choice, and I think we have to ascribe Ginny a certain measure of choice. But she's so sure. innocent and so she's at first year she's like the youngest she's dying not dying but she's like so eager to please um her name means virgin yes very very like the purity of the the unicorn she Mm -hmm. also shares in a sort of sense of purity she's the only girl in her family too right and the last child and i think i think that yeah so there's a lot there's there's something to be said i think in there right um Mm at least in terms of, of the symbolism. But I think, um, I think, so when the book, the book also consumes Harry in like this metaphysical way, right? It consumes the ink, um, mm-hmm. the metaphoric scarlet, the metaphoric blood, because the ink initially is scarlet that doesn't kind of affect it. But there's a, a moment where he gets like sucked into the diary, right? Yes. And like so, we'll see in the Pensieve. Yeah, later. it's just like the mm-hmm. it's very much like the Pensieve. And all of a sudden he he's time traveling and all of that. And what we see is that um, you know, again, like looking in hindsight, what Tom discovers is that in exercising his power, he's actually um his power over the basilisk, he's actually um jeopardizing the one thing that yes. he seems to value so like oh that's so good there's like a there's a folly in his abuse of power and the way that yes. he the way that he reacts unlike harry is to blame it on somebody like a scapegoat as you mentioned before right, right. so that, that to makes, me yeah. that to me explains some of the consumption right that like voldemort or tom riddle's relationships are never a relationship of equals there's never a moment where he like pities another there's never a moment where he sees himself as like on their level even with Dumbledore right like though he was I guess kind of afraid of Dumbledore like yes um, because of his penetrating eyes he could always see what he was up to right so there's like there's something about his relationships that is consumptive and I think it's born of a willingness to climb over people or to use or manipulate people to his own ends, I guess. And so it makes, to me, that I guess some of the consumptive nature is interesting. I think the last thing I'll say, because I I don't want to be talking for this long, but the last thing I would say is that it's interesting from like a a meta perspective, how readers can be consumed into these worlds, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Give their whole lives to them. Well, I mean, I, mean, I like guess are there people? Yeah, I guess who who who's um, I mean, look at uh, like look at the creepy line that Colin Creevy walks or like all mm-hmm. of the people who are clamoring to get Gilderoy Lockhart's autograph right. who like make up in their uh... minds some love story who like who like don't have a healthy understanding of the boundaries of story. Right. And yes. like, um. Now, I don't mean to, like, criticize all of the, you know, people who participate in, like, cosplay and, like, Comic-Con and all of that. And, like, whatever floats your boat, there's room for everybody at the table. Like, I don't care about any of that. I don't think that that's unhealthy. Um, But it could be Rowling sort of mentioning her first encounter with people like that. Maybe. And sort of casting her critical eye. Yeah, that, like, that, like, that, um, yeah, maybe that. And, you know, who are we kidding? I deeply want to go to Harry Potter World in Orange. Me too. Orlando. We should all go down. <laughs> we should all go down. It's very close to where I live. I want I want to dress up and I want to drink butterbeer and I want to yes. like, get a wand. There's a, by the way, 
Oh my god. There is a <laughs> there is a wizard bar that will make you a wand that's unique to you. The coming oh. to Ballard in Seattle, we all have to go. I say we have road, to go. I say road trip, we, but yeah. We sure. must. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a question. I have a question. Um because what Tom does in that in that diary when he sucks Harry in is he provides his perspective. But what his perspective does and I'll suggest that this is perhaps what a dark wizard does, sort of like gaslighting what, what uh, Wes brought up last mm. time. When you make somebody question their vision of reality and they, they have to interpret events like how you interpret them because you're wrong. Um, he provides his limited but, uh, but contrived perspective, his staged perspective of what happened on that night so that Harry sees things that did happen, sort of like Wes mentioned, seeing facts that are unconstellated, but he doesn't see how they actually worked together. He doesn't see the situation as it truly was. And it makes me wonder, thinking again about, like, say, the Sith and Star Wars, Mm -hmm. whether part of what dark magic is, is that it's sort of like the power of the lie, that you affect people's understanding of what is real and you, you falsify their picture of reality in some way so that they only see what's wrong so that they are uh, doomed to make mistakes or to fall into pits they otherwise would not have. That uh, hmm, I, I guess that's not really a finished mm. thought either yet, but I'm just seeing that there's a connection between dark magic and the lie. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I think it does have a lot to do with, like Sarah was talking about the, the kind of purpose that the perp- the person has for what they're showing or um, attempting to to tell with their story, right? Mm-hmm. Tom's purpose is it's a story, kind of, right? Yeah, it's it's fabricated, like you're saying, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and Tom's purpose is clearly to to draw in and and uh, make vulnerable um, people who he can uh, take advantage of, right? Whereas the the master storyteller Dumbledore is yes. is content to to leave people to their own like to make their own choices much much more that's that's kind of the big distinction that that I see within within the book right um, to to take it outside of that to look at sort of what Rowling is doing I mean she's she's kind of set up a, a, a structure where you've got to you've got to spin out seven years and somehow develop from one to the next in, in a way that makes sense. Um, we'll have to, I think, wait for more evidence about that, but it does seem to have to do with her, her fame, her immediate like explosion of fame and how she's kind of dealing with that in book two. And I would like to think about the difference between Voldemort forcing people to do that, including one of the unforgivable three curses being one where you force somebody to act exactly as you you wish them to i think it's the confundus charm or something the cruciatus is the painful one avada kedavra uh, Kedavra is the killing curse and and then there's just there's the one where you can control somebody and make them act precisely as you wish imperio right imperio Imperio, very good yeah yeah like you're the king over them from the latin imperio right that's you take over the 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 king of their conscious or the king of their body their consciousness that's that's fascinating well um y'all i do have to go in just a couple of minutes because i know y'all aren't getting back to teaching until after labor day but i'm already a couple weeks deep we didn't even get to talk to Cor- about cornelius fudge today mm. and his fudging things up and his cornu or horn like name um and so we didn't wanted- really talk about the polyjuice like yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh well, well, we yeah, well, you know, we have shown that we can go backwards as well as forward yeah. since we talked about the writing on the wall today. But did y'all have any any thoughts you really wanted to share very quickly about Cornelius Fudge? Or I mean, I think he he also sort of shared in something I saw about Tom Riddle, like the reason that he wants to take Hagrid in is he needs to be seen as doing something rather than mm-hmm. seeking after the cause. He again is just wiping things under the rug, which seems to be. The whole problem with this entire situation that there was a time when things were wiped under the rug and that just is not a real solution because it's going to come back up and other people are going to have to deal with it at some point. Um, it's like the, he's the opposite of what a real politician should be. 
or a real leader, somebody who actually deals with the situation at hand so that it doesn't get worse rather than just hoping that it will naturally get better. Yeah. He's like, maybe I he's like, say. yeah, I think he's, I think he's politician, not statesman. Right. Uh. Um, Cause I do, I do think unfortunately that is kind of what politics is, is optics anymore. I sure. mean, it, I mean, that's what it is in, in, in practice. I do. Um, I did think like one thing that was interesting that I noticed was as, so as like, uh, it's before Hermione gets petrified, but um, there's this mention that like the mandrakes are slowly but surely maturing. Yes. They threw a loud and raucous party in <laughs> Greenhouse 3, which is like, that's what adolescent mandrakes do, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> they want to act like humans. Yeah. And then, um, but uh, right in that moment, um, it's like Ernie McMillan you know, is finally polite to Harry. And this is after they've like gone to the Gryffindor common room and Harry's maybe had to swallow a little bit of his pride and re- and like accept that Malfoy isn't the heir of Slytherin. Right. And He's um, wrong again. Yeah, and like Ernie has to face his own wrongness, right? And eventually like, I mean, Hermione being petrified is a terrible thing. And I do think it's still interesting that it she's petri- petrified because of her discovery but um i like it almost has to happen to uh, for like that moment of instruction for people like ernie and i would argue harry um needs like the these moments of real discomfort to learn just how illogical their assumptions are right that Mm -hmm. like so ernie ernie sees like hermione petrified and just and is like, oh my God, you know, I'm, she's one of your friends. There was like this huge lack of logic being applied, like, uh, you know, yeah. um, to assume that Harry would be the heir of Slytherin. But like, you know, I think that's what kids, that's how, that's how kids learn is that they like go full speed into the completely wrong direction and then need some modification and like maybe you have to admit that they're wrong and, um, and that seemed that just seemed like a significant moment to me. You know, I wonder if it also is like that's part of what is so absurd about murder is you're killing somebody within your in group who is a necessary part of a functional society. It's like it makes just as little sense to murder somebody at Hogwarts if you really think about it um, as, as it does because this is your neighbor, right? You like share a ruler or having to pass something to this person and 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 even Tom Riddle when he when he was forced to think about it deeply realized that even though he could use this evil power and kill this person that it would ultimately cave in on him that which he loved and yeah no so like they just um the inability to appro- like so they like I don't know what the logical fallacy is technically yeah. called where you you use a insufficient amount of data to draw and like generalization yeah when you to draw so like he comes back from the diaries little adventure and it's like it was Hagrid and they're like well I did see him in Nocturne Alley and he did buy <laughs> Fluffy you know and Hermione's the one back there being like whoa 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 maybe Riddle turned in the wrong person right but that's what like it, like these like that's a lot of it's it's a logical fallacy to assume that Malfoy is the heir of Slytherin because he happens to share the the same political beliefs, you know, like, um, uh, I always do an, an, a lesson or two on like a bunch of logical fallacies just because I think it's really fun for them to learn all of the ways that they've been making bad arguments, (laughs) but like, and, and and all of the ways in which people around them constantly make bad arguments. Right. So, um, I, that's something that just sort of, it strikes me as like a real hallmark of the difference between maturity and immaturity. Hmm. And I know that's something that we've been talking about. Um, I think, I think your, your point about politics is interesting though, because that's something that gets kind of codified only once you gain maturity, do you sort of get mm. interested in politics? And that's like oh. sort of a whole other level of just, uh, well, so you even pointed out, Alex, like this has been a problem and it was sort of not dealt with 50 years ago. And now, lo and behold, here it is again. But it's right. been a problem since the 
you know, the untold the ages that this, this school has been founded mm. because it's founded upon one of the four houses is the house of Slytherin. And there's this, this deeply seated um, prejudice that he ascribes to and is built into Hogwarts, right? Like mm. one of the four pillars of the school, at least, is rotten at its core. It's, it's clearly uh, a political sort of thing um, that, that Hogwarts has um, sort of found the art of getting along with it, right? Because there's benefits to that too, right? That, mm. that evil contains uh, great you know, power and it's a way of like channeling people's ambition usefully. Like that seems to be the good thing about politics. You take mm. natural human failings and, and weaknesses and you channel them in a way that's less bad than it could be otherwise. Yes, basically, right. So long as you consciously recognize it, I it think that that was of work. Yeah. That was something yeah. that, like, we talked about maybe last pod or the one before about how maybe like the context in which J.K. Rowling is writing this, maybe like the mm. the emerging multicultural Britain yeah. British identity. Like, what if what if what Slytherin represents is like in the primary world if she's trying to make it like this is sort of how i read the book to our earlier point like what does her construction of a slytherin and an heir of slytherin with this type of political persuasion about what makes a good wizard what does that what argument is she making about the the primary world or what observation is she making is this what like a a freer liberal in like the most basic sense not in like the american political spectrum sense but is she Mm -hmm. making like in societies where we have freedom of thought where people aren't like you know imperial cursing you and telling you what to believe is this a is this is this what you have to accept alongside all of the other things do you have Mm -hmm. to accept Mm -hmm. do you have to uh, allow for hate hate speech like mud blood or and like how do you how do you construct a society that is both that that is free but is is free of that hatred i don't know if that's possible i think that that's like that's something right. that our country is grappling with deeply right now and has been for mm-hmm. the last maybe 50 or 60 years but like Cornelius Fudge isn't dealing with it openly like right. like right. no nobody wants to talk about like the reign of terror in the United States from 1880 to 1950. Nobody wants to talk about like lynching and no, you know, like no, no, there is, there are no memorials. I mean, there are now, but only Mm. in Alabama and it was only opened last year. Like, um, Mm. you know, there are, there are things that we have not talked about openly in this country. Right. right? And And talking about them, we can harness them to some extent or harness that, which, Harness that which left unconscious will harness us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. And so just a, just a funny note to end on is, is it not the case that the mandrakes will be ready to produce the potion once they are started moving into each other's pots? (laughs) (laughs) And, And so my question is, and we don't need to answer this yet, and it will connect to something, but you know, Eros connects to all things is, what is it exactly we're going to be milking from these mandrakes? <laughs> and, and so I only ask that. I only ask that not to be crude, but because I do think that's an interesting question. Are we just going? Are we going to kill these mandrakes, or are we going to, you know, milk them? But that <laughs> we mentioned that these characters are petrified, and that there's something about nature which has petrified them in sort of a Medusian way, and that each of them is around adolescence. And that it is precisely once these mandrakes get mature enough that their blood or seminal fluid will <laughs> break <laughs> the curse of this basilisk so that these kids are not petrified or have gotten past this age of petrification. It's like they're going to, they get petrified and then they receive some bit of information or consciousness or substance which makes them more mature, which gets them past the situation. And so I know that's a very funny point to be making. It just popped into my head. But, but I, I wonder about that since, you know, we have been thinking about 
you know, the, the place of adolescence in this text, especially, and these budding sorts of feelings and what they can do to you. And I mean, Hey, I don't know whether this happened to y'all, but sixth grade dance, I was definitely <laughs> hit by a basilisk and sat on <laughs> the left side of the, oh, yeah. the gym. And then like, e- even the girl teachers would try and get us to dance and I was not having any of it. Um, oh, yeah. because there was obviously a snake or a crocodile in the middle of that dance floor. And now I actually know that that's literally true because the powers of selection were not going to be selecting me because I was a very awkward sixth grader. But, um, <laughs> but I, but I do wonder because that has been an important part of the mandrakes, right? Their development just alongside the humans development. And so, so I don't know, maybe I'm just being funny. Maybe it's just late, but I like it. Yeah. All right, y'all. Well, so how about, can we do a shorter reading for next time? And split yeah, let's, in... let's just do the next two chapters. That's a longer, Great. that's long enough, I think. But that also leaves two for the last conversation. So there's Great. four left. So, And we can catch up where we need to and fill in details yeah, that way real. as well. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Cool. All right. Well, All y'all, right. It's, it's been another magical time. Have a good day at school tomorrow, Alex. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's rest. I will. Thank you, guys. Right. I'll be thinking about you. And uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one. All See right. Ya. Take All it right. easy. Good night. Bye. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.